thank you um, uh, for inviting me to uh, participate in this uh, forum. Um, I'm and for coming here to represent the Bjarke Engels group. My name is Hans, and it's an honor to be here meeting all you specialists in, uh, in visualization. And uh, seeing all the stuff going on out here, um, uh, perhaps I can tell you something um, you don't already know. Um, however, I will talk about the architectural work at BIG and how we try to, do, to uh, visualize design in different ways. And um, visualization is sort of the traditional uh, task for the designer. Uh, we have to communicate uh, our ideas in order to uh, explain to other people to understand what we're actually doing. And in order to do that, we produce this uh, um, series of drawings and illustrations. And um, uh, however, uh, other medias can also be used to inform, and it becomes very useful uh, in the field of architecture. And we repeatedly experience that people don't understand what we're actually talking about. So um, maybe our mission also is to uh, educate. Um, simplifying, we can say that we actually, uh, there are basically four different ways we, uh, we um, visualize architecture. First of all, we explain. We make a series of diagrams telling how the architecture is put together. And, um, that's showing sort of the bearing idea, and that's very significant for our work. Um, we describe, maybe that's sort of the traditional part of the work. We make, um, uh, we make the drawings, we describe for the contractor, the producers, how the uh, building is put together. Uh, third, uh, we have to sell. We have to sell our work to, uh, to get new work. We have to sell it to uh, other investors and other people that we would like to work with. Uh, fourth, which is uh, sort of, uh, to me, the most important part and the most interesting part, is that we feel that we, um, we need to educate. We need to uh, give something back to the people. We want to add value to our architectural um, work. And, um, so that there has to be an, an experience in architecture. Um, and that's sort of where I feel that visualization uh, uh, lies in the architecture. Um, and that's where we can sort of contribute to, uh, to new, uh, a new scene of architecture. And the first story I would like to tell is about how we decided to present big uh, in a new way. A couple of years ago, we were contacted by the Danish Center of Architecture, and they asked us to do a, um, a publication about our work. Um, but um, in a way, we sort of making a traditional uh, coffee table book showing nice images of our work, um, that wasn't really sort of our cup of tea. Um, so um, all these nice pictures, that would sort of only be a dead, uh, a dead image of, of an architectural work. So we, we decided to do something else, to tell the story uh, and maybe again to educate people. Um, and we ended up calling the book Yes Is More. And that was sort of a tribute to some of our former heroes, uh, starting up with uh, this guy who is uh, Mies van der Rohe. That was in the beginning of last century. He was um, doing architecture very, very modernistic architecture, and he wanted to get rid of, of all the ornamentation that was part of uh, the architectural scene at the time. Um, but after a while, uh, all buildings start to look the same. They became this kind of boxy uh, architecture. So then this guy came, and his name was Robert Charles Venturi. He was saying, less is a bore. He wanted to uh, reinterpret the ornamentation and the um, into the architecture, into postmodernism, and then this guy, this guy came along. His name is Philip Johnson. This was in the 80s, and he was saying that uh, you know, meaning that um, um, he wanted to adapt 
to the uh, changes of society much more quickly, and therefore it's sort of brought in architects, other architects and other specialists into uh, the architectural work, uh, because things became more complicated in the building process. Um, Obama saying that, I don't want to be the president for half the nation, but for the whole nation, saying that uh, I can say yes to all people of America. And, and this is very significant and sort of the reason why we call uh, this book Yes is More. And sort of reading this book uh, reveals um, a new idea of explaining architecture in a different ways. Um, Many, um, many people see sort of young architects as uh, revolutionary, or um, they want to do revolution by saying no to, to everything and restart from scratch and do things all over. Um, uh, we, don't, we don't want to do that at big, uh, even though some of us are, are young, some of them are young. Uh, <laughs> but we uh, rather want to learn and follow uh, the other guys that we've seen before, and therefore we want to be part of this kind of evolution instead. Uh, and the evolutionary process represents very well the way we work at, at BIG. And it's kind of like, like Darwin. He was explain, uh, explaining that the one most adaptable to change is the one that survives. Um, and when you're looking at sort of this diagram showing uh, um, the evolutionary process, that's very much like how we work. Um, a project sort of has to adapt to the changes, and the architectural species that is most adaptable to change is the one that survives. Um, we did a project in Copenhagen. This is uh, a site right, right next to Tivoli for you who know a little bit about Copenhagen, and it's a hotel. And all these models were changing, and part of this evolutionary process, and eventually, one figure, one architectural species uh, evaporates, and it's the one that survives. And, um, and this is um, sort of the way it turned out to be. Uh, let's see if it gets built. We don't know about that yet. Uh, but this evolutionary process uh, and all the models, they, they survive. They don't die in the sense that they get thrown away. They get it stored, and we have this archive at the office where we can sort of bring it back and it can uh, sort of come alive again uh, into a different situation. And, and um, that's also very um, uh, typical for, for the way we're working here. Um, another story here is this, uh, this image here um, of the uh, ecosystem. And it's taken from an early project, and it's sort of a reminder to us that we're designers, and uh, we're not only making 2D uh, facades and 3D models, but we're actually also designing sustainable systems, both uh, economical and social. Um, and, and you can see here, in terms of... Um, uh, this, this is taken from the uh, COP15 meeting in Copenhagen, and as you can see, it's not actually a party going on. Um, Merkel and Sarkozy, Obama, uh, um, they're kind of desperate. And, you know, the, the whole COP15 was a failure, and none of the goals were met. And sort of the whole, the whole discussion of sustainability drowned in the notion of much, how much of our existing quality can we uh, actually sacrifice in order to, uh, to become sustainable. So um, if we think that sustainable life is less fun than normal life, it's kind of an unattractive position we're taking. Um, so we want to we wanna think of, uh, of this in a different way. Uh, and if everyone... Um, well, we're taking this... We sort of taking this uh, position in our projects. We want to make hedonistic sustainability and find joy and quality in the architecture, in the life of architecture. And I will try to show how that, so what that has to do with um, visualization. I'm going to show uh, uh, a story of a project. This is uh, 
a recent one project in Copenhagen is the waste to energy plant. Um, it's uh, situated right in the center of Copenhagen. Um, it's the tallest building in Copenhagen. And uh, this waste to energy sort of take care of all the waste that Denmark produces. Denmark actually produces most waste in, in Europe, unfortunately. But take, building this building, we can sort of give back a more sustainable energy to the city. But um, instead of uh, sort of making a vast exhibition, uh, traditional exhibition, we thought of we have to do something else with the building. We have to bring people there. We have to give something back, uh, sort of a uh, uh, something extra. So we, we took this ski slope by the size of uh, Hestra here in Sweden and put it right on the top of the building roof. And um, uh, by that time, sort of, uh, parents can take their kids, go there, and be on the building and inside the building, and they can be more uh, part of what's actually going on. Maybe the parents can tell what's going on in there. So, so we're doing something else. Um, and to sort of even more emphasize that, we designed a chimney, which is actually right on the top where you start skiing. Instead of having smoke coming out, little, we make smoke rings. And, and smoke ring for each ton of CO2 the uh, power plant produces. So this is sort of the engineered solution to that. And, and, um, um, and through, through the visualization that we did during the competition, we sort of managed to explain, describe, and sell the project, and we won the competition. And um, the education, you can say that, li that lies sort of in, in the ski slope, in the smoke ring, and also in, in the facade, which uh, during summertime is a complete green facade, and all these uh, pots and plants can be hanging on this uh, quite large, large building. So in 2016, you're all welcome to the major ski resort of Copenhagen. Uh, another story I would like to tell is about the, um, the VM houses. The VM houses is located in, in the Örestad city of uh, Copenhagen, a new uh, sort of urban plan area. And uh, this project was, was in 2003, and it was the project that actually made uh, uh, the company big to take off as a, as a serious architectural firm. Uh, at that time, uh, the Danish economy was really good shape, so uh, the developer, he, uh, he built the whole thing without having pre-sold one apartment, which is quite... Um, <laughs> I would say. Uh, well, the story I would like to tell is actually um, another form of, of a visualization which lies in the form of art. Because uh, we early tried to uh, incorporate uh, art into this uh, project. And we proposed at the entrances, uh, um, uh, at the entrances of these buildings that that was a big aluminum uh, aluminum uh, facade, uh, 80 square meters, uh, quite boring. And we thought it was a good place for for having some art. So we asked the client if um, if we could, you know, if he could spend some money on buying in some some kind of art installation. And he was sort of responding that, guys, I'm. I'm not a gallerist, I'm, I'm a real estate broker, so why don't you go with the aluminum? So, um, yeah, we, um, we had to do this, but uh, not much later, we went to um, a dinner at the Royal Sass Hotel in Copenhagen, designed by uh, Arne Jacobsen. And in that restaurant, we saw this image, this painting hanging on the wall. It was kind of odd painting, a little bit weird looking, and, and we asked the, uh, the waiter who that was. And he explained to us that that was Alberto K, who was, uh, which was the name of the restaurant, but it was also the name of the hotel director at the time when the hotel was built. So, um, uh, and we also found out that the painter was none less than, than Arne Jacobsen, the architect himself. And we thought that was, that was kind, of, uh, kind of cool that the architect, big architect Arne Jacobsen, sort of turned himself into this Renaissance man and, and making, uh, making this, uh, this painting and sort of giving it to the opening to, uh, to, the, um, uh, to the hotel director and then sort of put it in the, in the restaurant. So we thought that was a really cool idea. And we told our uh, clients, 
about that, that um, we wanted to tribute them in some way. So um, uh, they, and they sort of yeah, gave us a shot. And since we're not very good painters, we uh, thought of this idea of using uh, bathroom ceramic tiles instead in different colors. Uh, and we um, made these uh, ceramic tiles like this at the entrances and eventually uh, shaping this uh, image of the client. There were two entrances, so one portrait of each in each corner. Um, and um, it's kind of fun because suddenly there, suddenly there was money in the budget for artwork. And we <laughs> kind of managed to make um, um, ass kissing into uh, an art form, literally. <laughs> um, and and, and Aristotle is a quite sort of um, open area, there's not much built out there. And uh, we like sort of to add to the uh, mytholo mythology of the area. And there was this uh, mother standing with her child outside the entrance. There's a kindergarten right next door. And, and uh, the kid was asking, like, mother, who is that? Oh, that's Elvis. So, so we're, adding, we're adding to, uh, to the area, kind of like that. Um, in 2006, we actually got a prize for this as one of the best, oh, the best housing project in Copenhagen. And we received a brass plate. Um, and with the permission of the, um, the client, we put the brass plate right in his mouth as a golden tooth. And, uh, he, you know, the client is still smiling because, you know, he was selling the apartments quite expensive and we drew them very cheap. So he was, um, he was very happy. Um, you can basically see it there. And also, it's kind of significant because uh, the house is part of the Danish version of, Monop of Monopoly, where it's the second cheapest lot at the site. But still, the client was happy. He was actually so happy that he bought the adjacent plot right next door and asked us to not do another project. Um, and that project, we ended up calling the mountain. Um, and I would like to tell how the actual arch uh, architecture visualizes the idea and how we came to call this uh, the project The Mountain. So, yeah, this is uh, how we thought it was going to look like in the beginning. But actually, the site was situated right north, as you saw. It's 8,000 square meters. It's a uh, housing block situated, that was sort of the, the legal plan. That's what the authorities wanted us to do. So they wanted this um, housing block between the metro line, which goes right uh, to the left, and the parking structure. And we thought that was a really bad position for a housing block, uh, not only because of, of sound of the train, but also looking into this parking structure would be really boring. So we did this instead. And we had to adjust it to the height regulations towards um, um, the uh, city and to the train. And we pushed it down, creating a really nice south-facing hill. Um, and we adjusted it to, so that we don't block any views from, uh, from the existing buildings, uh, and also to sort of achieve all the sunlight. Um, we did this parking structure underneath, and we wrapped that facade into, uh, along the parking structure, and then sort of laid this um, 10 meter grid of, of uh, uh, penthouse uh, apartments on top of it, and then adjusting it so that everyone gets uh, a garden just the same size as your, uh, your apartment, uh, just like that. Kind of simple uh, scheme explaining uh, how the, uh, what the intentions are. Um, but then, when you enter the, um, the space in between or underneath, the, um, the parking structure, you, uh, you can see the colored part, which is actually the corridors that, uh, from where you enter your apartment. You're overlooking this gallery of, uh, of, of car parking as a sort of um, uh, kind of car culture underneath there. And we have, um, we have added this um, diagonal elevator that goes all the way through up there. Um, you know, we don't have any um, hills in, in Copenhagen or in Denmark at all, basically. So we had to import this from Switzerland, where they have a natural need of inclined elevators. So uh, we put that one in, and then you have bridges going out to your, um, your apartments. 
and, and uh, this is the elevator. And, and this space sort of tells the story a little bit about how the architecture is working and, and without uh, creating a claustrophobic uh, parking garage. Um, something like this. The most important part, sort of the, one of the biggest issues we have to take care of doing this scheme was the, the actual facade, the facade facing uh, the city. And uh, it's a very, very big facade. And inside the facade, you know, you have the garage, and you need to, to be able to, uh, for the garage to breathe, to get the fumes out. So it needed to, uh, something that was um, transparent. So we came up with this idea of, of uh, making holes into uh, aluminum uh, plates. Uh, it was this company who was able to do small holes and big holes. So by doing holes in different size, and having a darker inside than outside, that would mean that you'd actually create a rasterized image. So um, by getting further away, you can, like, just like in a, in a newspaper, you would get a very clear image of a, of a mountain. And in the end, sort of, the, the, um, the image of the mountain came from, from this guy, this Himalayan photographer who, who uh, supported us with this image of the uh, Mount Everest. Um, and, uh, yeah, you can see how the, um, the plates were mounted. Uh, I kind of love this image. We can see the, the workings, workers coming out of the mine <laughs> of the, uh, um, the mountain. And sort of uh, the further you, um, you actually get away from the project, the more uh, convincing the, uh, the resolution of the image becomes like this. And um, we really want to take sort of the, uh, uh, the theme of, of the mountain to its extreme. And, uh, you know, not, not having any hills in, in, uh, in Copenhagen whatsoever. Um, we also, <laughs> there was also this space up at the very top of the Mount Everest. Uh, there is only a three meter gap between the elevator course and the stair course to the actual facade. So we couldn't use that for parking. So uh, we got um, called this uh, Copenhagen Mountain Climbing Club, and they, uh, they put up a mountain climbing wall on the inside of the uh, Mount Everest um, image. Um, and uh, it's also to emphasize, you can actually, as a visitor, enter the parking structure on the other side and then walk on a stair. You can see the stair climbing up along the edge of, uh, along the rim of the mountain and, and sort of reach the peak of, um, of the building. And, and that is, in a sense, uh, that we want to sort of give something back again and, and letting people use the architecture and, and um, so they get an added value of this building, which is traditionally would belong to the people living there and being sealed off for them. Um, but then, um, yeah. Um, if you look at the sort of inside, it's a much big difference. It's much more soft materials, and, and this, these images are taken right after the opening, so there is still not, not much green going on. And, and these green uh, benches uh, are sort of making the separation so you don't stare directly down into your neighbor. But eventually, um, the whole mountain will uh, appear as a, as a green hill. It's like that. Um, another project, which is, um, yeah, as I told you before, the client was, was smiling. He was actually still smiling after this one. So he, uh, he gave us a new commission, and, and this time he thought, he, I'm really going to put you on a try here. So he gave us, up to the far north, you can basically see the uh, VM houses and the mountain, and on the further south, there was nothing really built and still actually isn't much built. It's getting on. The Danish economy is getting better, so it's getting built around. But on the very far south uh, end of uh, the Örestad, and there is uh, a huge, beautiful green landscape, and uh, he wanted to build 60,000 square meters of uh, housing uh, mixed with uh, 400 uh, workplaces together with some other functions. 
this is basically how they interpreted the uh, the area to be in in some years. Um, but um, these are some images showing the actual situation. As I said, it's very close to the nature, and uh, this view over the area is, is really, uh, really beautiful. And uh, this, is, this is what the, um, the client wanted, to, uh, wanted us to make. A parameter block, slam into the site, um, create housing, maximizing that. But he was also very interested in, in another part of Copenhagen called the potato row houses. Um, soon 200 years old, uh, being very popular, very close to the center, very alive and very has some really nice feelings to it. And he wanted us to, to make that. Can you make that in the Arestad area? And knowing us, he knew that we wouldn't do that, but he sort of tried it in anyway. So this would be the um, kind of scheme that we would have to use, you know, making housing, making uh, commercials, making offices, uh, and mix. Ingredients, uh, ingredients is like this in a traditional way. But we, we very much like this area as well, and we thought of how can we, what can we take? What is, what's, what's the thing about this one? And the situation is basically that you have a row house, you have a garden, and you have a passage, a passage where uh, kids are playing, running back and forth, which is also existing on the backside. So we thought of, okay, let's take the path. That's really working. We take that and we wrap it around the whole building, like this, starting here, going all the way through. You have your uh, two-story um, housing, you have your garden, you have your passage. And, um, oops. Um, I, will, uh, I will give you a, a little movie uh, telling this story. It's, uh, it's a a movie we did for the, to the client, and uh, Bjarke is, uh, is talking. And it's a very long movie, so I'm going to um, cut out a little piece for you, see where I was. All right. Here we go. Yeah. 
Yeah, well, through this visualization, we managed to uh, persuade the, uh, the client of, of doing, uh, doing this to the building and um, um, to sort of bring the potato row houses into a massive building, building block like this. Um, and, and the movie, in the movie, we try to also, and we've been using it a lot afterwards, to educate and inform about the project. It's, it's pretty much like, like a, a piece of art, an artwork where the more you know about the uh, painter, the more you know about the, um, the time he was living in, and the more the, you know about the techniques, the more you can appreciate the artwork. And, and, um, um, and also, as a benefit to the people living there and using it, um, the social uh, activities are sort of normally fixed to the ground floor level. And here we can um, sort of activate and use um, the whole building, uh, the entire architecture at all levels. So um, um, I will sort of really uh, quickly uh, show you. Um, um, this is sort of the, um, the way it looks today. You can see the path coming down all the way from up here uh, down to the ground, starting at the bridge over here. And we made this other film showing um, Sound please. If there is any. If there ain't, it works anyway. Yes, it's, not, it's done last spring, it's, uh, it was just finished. People are starting to move in and, and um, it's a very, very big site and a very big project for us. Um, so if educating uh, is, is, is important for us in our work, uh, none of, of this would possibly be done without uh, the selling part. And, and it is a big part of our job. And, and it's done very much through visualization, as I talked about before. And it, in that sense, TV would probably be the, uh, the greatest media. So finally, I would like to show another short uh, movie. And uh, we're going live, so I hope this is working. It's, um, it's a clip taken when Bjarke is visiting the CNN in America. And he was interviewed uh, about the architecture. And if visualization also incorporated speed speech, um, this would be the sort of the best way to sort of um, reach out to people. Oh, I think I do it here.
All right. That was some uh, repetitions to bring the message out. Um, thank you very much for your time. Uh, thank you very much for your talk. We are amazed, I think, to hear how well you listen to your uh, clients and then you think how you can turn it into a, a mountain. <laughs> And then you use visualization in an extremely clever way, and then you build an amazing architecture. Uh, we are, I mean, that you even take the Swedish resort from Hestra. <laughs> of Denmark course. <laughs> so, do we have any questions? Do you see anyone? Maybe you can talk to you in the, in the lunch. We will have, if you don't have anything now, we have a lunch break until we have our, our two seminar, parallel seminars after lunch. So I have a present for you. Oops. Oops. So, thank, thank you. you very much. Yeah, Thanks. Thank it was nice to be here. here Thank you for listening. <laughs>